This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode three of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Finish him! Open fire! Disregard that order! Arrest Baron de Lamb! Little prince, you dare! The security forces are mine to control. Now that I have proven the- What you've proven here is your hypocrisy. You've been scapegoating metahumans, though you yourself were a metahuman. Clearly, you've done business with the metahuman traffickers my parents were trying to stop. You lied to them! No, no, I- And your great skill with your meta-ability? That, no doubt, required time to master. Which tells me you received your powers long before Brion. Oh, I know you, Uncle. And it's clear your deceptions were the groundwork for a coup against my family and Markovia. You have no hard evidence! We have enough to mount a lengthy investigation into your affairs. I place you under arrest for the murder of my mother and father. (laughs) And with all that, let's hand it over to Emily Forb. Hello, Megan! So the title for this week's episode is Eminent Threat. The release date was January 4th, 2019. The in-episode date was July 31st. That's it. One episode, one day, one episode. (laughs) The writer was Brandon Vietti. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Our special guest voice credits. Of course, we have all of our returning team from season one and two, but there's a lot of new characters uh, and actors. Sarah Vuzzel now gets credited not as Dead Girl, but as Halo Girl <laughs> in the credits. Uh, we get Whitney Moore uh, doing the voice of Courtney Whitmore, <laughs> which is never not hilarious. Because life is weird. That's right. And uh, Nolan North uh, does the voice of Connor, of course, but also Frederick DeLam. And I bring that up because he doesn't argue with himself very much, but he does punch himself out. <laughs> so that's kind of awesome. There you go. Let's get on to our mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. Our episode opens with a login screen for something called Good Goggles. The user clicks on an interview show called Stargirl, and we get an interview between Courtney Whitmore and Garfield Logan on the set of Space Trek 3016, everyone's favorite sci-fi young adult adventure series. We find out Gar is now dating Queen Perdita from season one, episode Cold Hearted, where Wally saves Perdita by delivering a heart for her transplant. And we also find out that they met at Wally's funeral. (laughs) Gut punch. Yep. And we also find out that Gar is an openly meta civilian, so not a superhero anymore. He talks about the metahuman trafficking ring, and on his final line, if you see something, scream something, we cut to Prince Brion in a pod, screaming as he is drowned in tar. (laughs) It's so subtle this season. (laughs) (laughs) See Uh, something, scream something, and then we ah! see something, and someone screams something. Somebody screams. Two on the nose, Greg. Brandon. (laughs) Back on the beach outside the Markovian Children's Hospital, Artemis and Jeff plan to infiltrate the secret metahuman facility via the sewers while Nightwing sneaks into the facility from the front. He finds the spy gear that Jeff and Connor had left behind in the previous episode, but it's smashed. And he finds out that Dr. Jace and Dr. X are working together while Superboy and Brion are stuck in pods. Vertigo enters and we find out that Dr. Jace manipulated X in order to give powers to Brion, in order to stop 
the Bedlam program, working from the inside to break it down. Baron Frederick de Lamb arrives on the scene, revealing himself to be the mind behind Project Bedlam. Plasmus then attacks Lightning and Artemis, Halo Girl, quote unquote, and the Super Cycle appear to rescue them. And that particular fight enters the metahuman facility and hilarity ensues. <laughs> sure, hilarity. That's what we'll call it. We're going to call it that. Nightwing, I'm working on it. <laughs> it still remains one of my favorite jokes <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> So Jace and Nightwing then free Brion and Superboy, and Jace shows Nightwing how to destroy the facility, ensuring the tar is destroyed with it. Halo continues to protect Artemis and Lightning from Plasmus with a force field as Delam and Vertigo send several metahuman kids, still in pods, through a boom tube created by a father box in Vertigo's possession. A lot to unpack there. Yeah. The facility is blown up by Nightwing and Jace because, of course, it is. <laughs> we blow stuff up in this show. It's a hallmark. It's a YJ hallmark. <laughs> it's a secret quiet mission where we blow blow up stuff. Yeah. It's how this show works. It's part <laughs> It's part of why we love it. It's part of the charm. <laughs> right. uh, they do that while Baron DeLam returns to the party and announces that Brion is a metahuman working with the traffickers. Back on the beach, Brion wakes up. Angry and confused, uh, causing him to lose control of his new geologic powers. Superboy steps in and helps to calm his rage, while Oracle makes Nightwing aware of a news broadcast of Bedlam framing Brion for the murder of his parents and the abduction of his sister Tara. Brion rages toward the palace to face Bedlam while Superboy follows him. A boom tube then opens on the beach, allowing Plasmus, Vertigo, Dr. X, and Henchy to arrive, we see that X is also a metahuman, able to create psychophysical constructs of himself, and that all of them carry apocalyptic weapons. Brion arrives at the party and attacks Bedlam, who we find out is also a metahuman. Bedlam, not more highly trained in the use of his powers, keeps Brion at bay, while back at the beach, Artemis and the team attempt to defend Halo and Jace. But during the battle, Halo is killed by Plasmus, angering Jeff so badly that his powers return and he attacks the monster. We soon find out that Halo, though horribly burned beyond what a human can survive, regenerates herself back to life. She's fine. It's <laughs> I'm fine. fine. I'm fine. Half her face is gone. This God. is fine. <laughs> so hard to watch. Oh, Crown Prince Gregor then arrests Baron DeLam as it is clear that he has had his powers far longer than Brian. Uh, when DeLam tries to kill Gregor, Superboy lays him out. And it <laughs> makes me so happy. Unfortunately, Gregor is forced through political pressure to exile his now metahuman brother, who leaves with Superboy. Back at the beach fight, Lightning shorts out the control mechanism that's on Plasmus's neck, freeing him. Vertigo and Henchy escape via boom tube, but unfortunately, a bystander on the beach, believing Plasmus to be a monster, shoots him through the brain. Overlooking the carnage and the aftermath, physical, emotional, and political, Artemis turns to Dick and says, Nightwing, what do we do now? And we all nod at that question. <laughs> like, same, girl, same. Yeah, same, yeah. Whew. All right, let's go to the Aster. Let's, let's just go, go, the yeah, let's go straight to Aster. It'll be fine. It's fine. <laughs> Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. All right, Emily, let's dive into this. So starting with Garfield again, because he's the beginning of our episode again. I like that during his interview, he's just wearing a Batman shirt. Like, of course he I is. appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little nod. He's like, yeah, no, no, I still still love my superhero fam. Uh, got the merch. <laughs> he can afford it. <laughs> he can. Oh, But with that same interview, I love Gar and Perdita are real cute. They're just real cute. We get like one, we could get one clip of them, but I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting choice and I'm here for it. Uh, and the fact that they met at Wally's funeral is both completely heartbreaking and a great little bit of world building. And it makes so much sense. Like once they said it, I'm like, well, of course you did. You're hurting my heart. But of course, that makes perfect sense. Where else would you have met? Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I do think Wally would be happy for them. <laughs> Like Stargirl do, says it to try and change she, the subject, but I'm like she she does, but I have to say it kind of made me uncomfortable. 
that line. Yeah, she's just like, um. Well, he's dead, but I'm sure he's happy that I'm just like, this is, I'm, what? Okay, but how do you respond? (laughs) That's, uh, roll with it, Gar, I guess. Like, yeah, but, uh. (laughs) Sorry, it just. (laughs) No, I I agree. I agree. It it was felt, (laughs) felt really strange to me. Anyway. Uh, so to a di- completely different thing, I really, I pointed this out in our scream something, but I still love it every time I watch this episode. The fact that Barbara just casually uses emojis in her mid-mission messages to, to Nightwing <laughs> just makes me smile. I like that they're this casual and they're that they're just this chill. And why they're that casual may, you know, be crashing the mode, but I like it. It's cute. It's fun little character moment. Because she doesn't get to talk this episode, but she can still send him emojis and laugh at his <laughs> right. failures. And along those, in that same scene, we also we see more of Nightwing's beetle that showed up in last episode. But like seeing it again this episode, my reaction to it is always the same thing. Where I'm like, why is this not a super teeny tiny bird? Boy, you have an aesthetic. <laughs> All of your gadgets have to fit an aesthetic. That's how the Bat Fam works. Yeah, it's got to be a thing. I just feel like it's, it's got to be a thing. It's right? got to be a beetle thing. Yeah, it's got to be a beetle thing. We we don't. Nothing can just pass under the radar. We're like that's that seems slightly off. It's a thing, isn't it? Young Justice, reveal your secrets. <laughs> There is a later moment also with Nightwing where when they find out who Baron Frederick DeLam is, we have Nightwing saying, how did I not notice that DeLam is an anagram for Bedlam? Right. And at first, like, it may seem like he's just being hard on himself until you remember that we're talking about Dick, I dismantled the English language for fun, Grayson. Right. Who, yeah, you're presented with that. You're like, how did I not notice but that? But also, he was the sidekick to Batman who has villains like Riddler. Like, this is like, this is like smack in his wheelhouse. He's had a busy day. You've had a, had a hard day. And also, I really do love the banter in this episode. We were joking about it before with the, I'm working on it. Him and Artemis have a real good rapport in this episode, in this series of episodes. And I love it. I love the no powers, no problems team. Like, I don't ship them. I know some people do. Trot shippers more power to you. But I love I love their little their little bro bro TP over here. Uh, <laughs> bro TP. Am I, am, I, am I teaching you more shipping lingo? Is bro that... TP. It's like an OTP, but with friendship. I love it. We we invent things and then we need names for them, right? Right. Welcome to being human. <laughs> Welcome to being human. Welcome to shipping. Also, I I really just kind of love the detail of Artemis just kind of panic naming halo in the middle of the fight because she just yes. needs something to call this right. kid exactly. like they can't just be like this dead teenager that is following us around she's just like um words uh, it, H- halo girl that's what i'm calling you until we get a real name that's what we're going with okay let's go because <laughs> that's just how people <laughs> we invent things and then we need a name for them that's we right need people and we need something to call them and if they don't have names we make something up we also have, I know both of us loved the scene with Connor on the beach with Brion that it's just, again, another one of those moments where Connor recognizes that anger and wants to help because he's been there. And it's so good. It's so heartwarming. I love, I love seeing Superboy get to be like that emotional anchor for people that like you would not expect looking at the first episodes of season one, but he's matured and he's grown and he's also kind of taken on like another one of Black Canary's roles in that way. And I like it. Yep. Like we've talked before about how he's kind of, it seems like he does a lot of the combat training. And he also has a little bit of Black Canary's therapist role under his belt now. <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I do. I love it. And also on that beach scene, we get on like my, my like fifth watch through, I started thinking about this moment with Barbara again a bit more where she texts Nightwing and... I love that she's keeping track of everything right now. Like, she is trying to keep track of this mission, but also apparently has news alerts set up somewhere of, like, if anything happens in Markovia, I need to know about it. Yeah. Immediately finds this out. Immediately knows this is something they need to seal, see and deal with immediately. And also that she needs to specifically tell Dick 
that this is something everyone needs to see. Because she doesn't say you need to see this. She says you all need to see this. Yeah, yeah. Because she knows that Dick as a person might just keep it secret if she only sent it to him. So she's just like, no, no, show it to everyone. Show it to everyone right now. (laughs) Because he's hiding her. (laughs) And I love that nobody questions like how Dick knew what was going on. They just accept it. They're like, it does oh, seem Batman's it does kid. seem pretty classic Dick though. Like it'd be like, hey guys, I've got an alert set up or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's not like this this version of Dick isn't an amazing computer hacker himself. It's just Oracle schools him. You know it's what I mean? Just, you know, he's currently doing gymnastics. He needs somebody else there to to keep track of things for. You know what popped into my head? <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember? I think it was in one of the bloopers. Where you randomly went to go see like an episode or an issue of Nightwing (laughs) and then you like opened it up and there was like this one of these classic ridiculous poses Nightwing was in. That's what just just popped into my head when you were like, he's busy doing acrobatics. Well, Dick is busy doing acrobatics. Oracle is making sure that they actually know what's happening in the political sphere of Markovia. (laughs) Right, exactly. And we talked a bit about this, moving to another scene on that beach. We talked a bit about it of like, I'm personally not a fan of the lingering close-ups on the brutalization of Halo. It's a lot. It's not my favorite. Um, But I do appreciate the way that it's used as how Jefferson gets his powers back. Because it feels emotionally honest to have that moment and amazingly acted by Kari Payton of just that moment where he gets them back and just kind of rages. I'm like, no, I, f- I feel that. I feel that right now. Yeah, I And agree. it's handled really well. I just, you know, I'm personally, personally don't like seeing a teenage girl burned, burned half to, half to heck all over her face. Yeah. Not my fave. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll end up talking about more about Halo's regenerative powers in other in, in follow-up episodes as well. But Maybe. I do, I do agree with you. Like I, watching this, I was like, "Ooh!" I mean, it absolutely floored me. It was definitely one of those, "Oop!" Not Cartoon Network moments again. But I agree with you. It felt emotionally accurate to have Jeff linger. Therefore, we're lingering because we're on this train wreck with him. <laughs> we are on this. We are on this emotional train wreck, and we are taking the ride directly into the side of a mountain. But we mentioned this briefly in our last episode, unless Neil cut it out that. There was a thing that I caught that we were like, stay tuned for next episode. It's oh, next yeah. episode. It is. When Superboy <laughs> rages off to the castle. No, Superboy doesn't rage. Brion rages. Brion's favorite mode of transportation is rage. Uh, and Superboy <laughs> follows calmly <laughs> like so an adult. Uh, when they have that big fight scene outside the castle, there's a woman filming it on her phone. And I noticed this time through that Connor's face is spiraled out on her screen. And if you go back and watch, it's right after he picks up Queen Perdita and gets her out of the way of lava. There's just a woman with a smartphone who is like filming this because of course she is. Uh, And there is one moment where the phone is turned so we as the audience can see the screen on it. And as Connor turns around, his face turns into a little spiral. Attention to detail because he's wearing the mask again, which we think is what does that. I didn't see that at all. I saw it in the notes and your notes and I was like, what? I'm going to have to go watch it again. Yes. It's near, it's around the almost 17 minute mark, a little bit before the 17 minute mark. If you want to go check that out and keep a, keep an eagle eye out for smartphone filming in the middle of active superhero battles, not the safest choice, but leads to some interesting little Easter eggs. Yeah. I just, every time I see something like that, I think about the process. (laughs) because <laughs> this isn't just a random thing like somebody said okay we want somebody in the audience you know or somebody in the at the party to pull out their phone and do a recording and then we're going to do that and it's going to be the same animation of course that's in front that we're seeing on superboy and then also do this with his face and then like there's a whole conversation that had to have happened yep I, between <laughs> writers storyboarders animators everything you gotta mm-hmm. go down a line and make sure that it gets in there yeah little details it does make me wonder things. after talking to the storyboarders if maybe that was a storyboard thing. Like somebody was like, oh, you know, it'd be maybe. cute as if we did this. That seems like it might have happened for sure. Maybe. 
We'll have to we'll have to ask next time we we ever get to talk to any of them. Right. Just be like, hey, do you remember this like one shot from this one episode early in the season? Whose idea was that? <laughs> right. <laughs> Who do we thank? Oh, uh, we're those kinds of fans. Anyway. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> kind of. A little bit. But a little politely. bit, maybe a little bit. But, a little right. bit, but politely. <laughs> right, exactly. So we talked about Perdita a little bit in the last episode. Like we get, we finally get a shot of grown up Perdita, what she looks like. Cause she was yes. 10 in the first she, season. Yes. She's 17 now. She was 10 in the first season and she's 17 now. Okay. That tracks. Yeah. Clearly Perdita. Like I didn't notice her in the first episode. Like, of course, it was just like, all right, there's a bunch of people in the background. It's a blonde girl in a purple dress. That right. could be anyone. It could be half the team. Got a lot of blondes. <laughs> it could be half the team. Actually, Arrowette just snuck into this for no reason and was just chilling there. <laughs> he could have been. We've never seen her without her mask, but it's Perdita. Right, exactly. Yeah, but then, of course, in this episode, after we'd seen Perdita at the beginning, and then I saw her there, and then we knew Vertigo was there and involved, and we found out that they're neighbors, Markovia and Vladivar are next to each other. Yep. Right? Okay. I mean, that makes perfect sense that she's there. It makes me wonder, like, how different would this episode have been had Gar decided to go to this coronation party with her? That would have been so good. Well, I think part part of me, I was thinking through this whole, again, the whole process of the creation part. I'm sure that crossed their mind. If they're putting her in the background, but then they're like, okay, but is what is he adding? Is he adding something to the, to the scene, to the episode? Do we need him there for something? Is he just going to be in the background and not do anything? No, we can't have him be there. It's got to be something yeah. else. Yeah. Like it would have, it would have caused too, too many questions that we didn't need right there. Like I feel like it, not questions, but it would have caused us to be like, wait, like it would have, it just, it would have taken away a little bit of the focus yeah. that we didn't need. But I, like it does knowing that they're together to, for me, at least like does add the fact that like Superboy, Superboy saves her. I wish they could have had like a moment of her just being like, hey, wait, I know you. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're, you're my boyfriend's like brother in law, sort of. <laughs> right. Oh, I guess that's true. huh? Yeah. Because <laughs> she does know all of them. that's true. It, yeah. That's crashing the mode a little bit. Uh, Is it? She, kind of. She, she knows them. Oh, that's true. She does. <laughs> we do find out that she definitely knows the rest of the team. She at least knows Connor and Megan. That's true. My boyfriend's brother-in-law. My boyfriend's future brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even make that connection. I did, but only this time through. And if I if I was a like a a fan fiction writer, I definitely <laughs> want to like would want to write the scene where she comes home or he sees the news and he's like, what happened? And then they have this conversation about what, what happened. And like, he's, he's currently like filming something like he's busy right now, clearly. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, maybe planting the seeds of him going back into the, into the life again, you know, I don't know. It could be, it could be interesting, but let's talk about something much more important. Dr. X's mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that pencil thin mustache, man. That that rode the character design from the original <laughs> Double X to this. Dr. Double X was his supervillain name. Uh, and he could make a single duplicate of himself, not a bunch. And his costume had an X on the chest, except his duplicate had double X's on its chest. Because I don't even know why. It's just ridiculous. Because comic book gimmicks. <laughs> right. But at least they didn't put him because he had this he had this mask. And it's just anybody who wears like a half mask over his face, a Batman style mask, and it has a has a mustache <laughs> or a beard or something. It's just weird. I don't know why. I'm just not used to it. Open your mind, Rich. Except except to these differences. Picture producer Neil in your head and now put a mask on him. You would still know it was him with that beard of his. You just know. Yeah? Should do that for the next Halloween party, producer Neil. Anyway, <laughs> on to Stargirl. So, Courtney Whitmore. Uh, I don't know how... This is not how I was expecting Stargirl to enter into this at all. <laughs> but it works. It does. Except I'm kind of... I mean, Stargirl is a character from... It's been around for a while. She inherited, well, 
There's so much going on. She had the costume for a character called the Star Spangled Kid who was in the All-Star Squadron. She didn't have powers until she was given the, the um, oh God, what's it called? The Star, it was the Star Rod. I think they changed it to the Star Staff that was from a character named Starman who was also in the Justice Society. She inherited that. Her father-in-law, not father-in-law, her stepfather is a mechanical engineer and he creates a powered suit that's called Stripe. And you've seen, and these characters have been all over the place. So Star and Stripe are definitely in Justice League Unlimited. Uh, Star Girl shows up in Brave and the Bold. She still shows up in Justice League Action. Like she's in a bunch of, she was in, she was in, showed up a couple of times, I think in the last couple of seasons of Smallville, the live action <laughs> version. Like Star Girl is somebody that not a lot of people know, but she's been, at least recently in the last 10 years, she has been in all kinds of animated and live action material, and she's getting yep. her own show, apparently. Yeah. Coming S- soon to the DC universe. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm curious as to how, but she was never this, she, I, I don't think so. I don't think she was ever a, like a broadcaster or a interviewer of some sort. Like, I don't think that was part of her background. So, I mean, is she just going to stay this way and it's just a cute we nod? Update. We adapt. <laughs> we do, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm curious as to see where they're going to be going with Stargirl in a later season. And we we've already we, we've already mentioned that there's been a couple season of nine. Starman villains that have already showed up in the show, like Mist. So, I don't know. We'll see. Once again, a whole Young Justice imprint of comics to be able to explain <laughs> and show us all of these stories would be fantastic. It would. I agree. Give us all the comics. Um, Baron Bedlam, I talked about in our Intel Update 12 and the free comic book day comic commentary about how are you going to pull off Baron Bedlam, ridiculous name, the whole deal. And they do they There's do no it. way they ever could. <laughs> yeah, why would you do and that? Then- <laughs> Who would do that? Greg and Brandon would do that. They just have like a, a box of characters that people are like, you can't make this serious and threatening. And they just take one out every just couple of episodes. And like, throw the gauntlet me. down. <laughs> Sportsmaster, look, we made him better. Right. Baron Bedlam, great now. Right. Hold my beer. And off he goes. Yeah, just, yeah, I don't even know what to say. It works. It works. The Superboy fight scene, the fighting style you're talking about, like the the... The aspects of Black Canary, this kind of counseling thing. He learned so much from just letting go of his yeah. expectations and letting and his ego and listening to Black Canary on so many levels, including it takes three hits to drop Baron Bedlam. It's One, so it's like good. a backhand to the face and then like in an armpit and then a haymaker and then he's down, like done. Uh, oh, it just makes me happy every time I see it. I wanted to give a, a shout out to. Uh, Joshua uh, Lappin Bertoni, I think is how you pronounce his name. I mentioned in our scream something about this guy that's on the beach at the end that shoots plasmas through the brain. Uh, he's credited as as Nicholas Stofka. I mentioned it in the DC Daily. He's he's a he was just a random supporting cast character from what I thought was a Halo comic back in the day. He had found Halo on the beach when she had her memory problems and. And that kind of stuff is what I thought was going on. But that's not actually what it was. He actually tracked it down. Um, Joshua is the writer for the DC Universe kind of breakdown of of things. He's a he's a uh, he's a columnist for DC. We're actually going to get him on the show to talk about some stuff as well. Awesome. But um, what they what he writes is the old man who shot plasmus is Nicholas Stovka. His comic counterpart was a much younger man who we met in Outsiders issue number fourteen in a backup story that was written by Mike Barr. And penciled by Mary Wilshire. He was a Markovian youth who befriended the hero Windfall, also a blonde, and helped her escape a group of angry villagers. I don't know Windfall. For some reason, I thought that was Halo. I don't know. Anyway, hats off to Joshua for getting the much more detailed details than I got um, from before. So um, uh, it's fantastic. And he, Joshua, runs down a lot of the uh, other Easter eggs that we found uh, ourselves as well, but they're worth checking out his, his, uh, Articles. All what over Neil, the DC universe. What does Neil mention? Oh, Neil mentioned that one of the children's hospital buildings is named after Queen Ilona, Ilona uh, per the sign out front of the building, <laughs> which just makes her death even more 
brutal and so insulting to have like this metahuman trafficking ring being in the children's hospital that she established. So either it's a lot. I hate to go into some tin hat theory that she was involved somehow, but I can't imagine she was. If she was, I I don't know. For some reason, that bothers me. So don't do that. No, no, no. Of course, you mentioned Courtney Whitmore, voiced by Whitney Moore. <laughs> Which just, we in just, one of our scream somethings <laughs> messed up. Did we? Oh, I think I got it backwards, didn't I? Yeah, we were like, <laughs> that yeah, was, that was me. <laughs> Whitney Moore, voiced by Courtney Whitmore. <laughs> we don't and know for sure. Neither of us caught it until the recording came out, and they've I was like, n- never been oh, seen no. in the same place at the same time. We don't know. <laughs> yes, they anyway, have. Rich. That was on. That was on me. Sorry, Whitney. <laughs> oh, but it's great. World's uh, weird. What's that? It's great. World's weird. Sometimes weird. these things just happen. <laughs> Another thing Neil says, was DeLam wearing a skin suit this whole time? It's implied that yes. Kind of. And I try not to think about it. Kind of a lot. Yeah. It's it's like weird flashbacks to um, Blockbuster in the very first two episodes. Yeah. Got your nose. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just, there's, no. it's not okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, crazy. <laughs> anyway, and then when we got done with these three episodes, I was just like, I don't know where are they going from here. This is like, how could it get crazier? It can only just get more mellow from here, right? <laughs> stay tuned for next week. <laughs> stay, stay tuned for, for yeah. For the next three episodes. Same bat time, same bat <laughs> podcatcher. That's right. There will be chaos. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with our canary debrief and more. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid roll. A few announcements this week iTunes now has season three available in the U.S. We hope that it means it'll become available digitally in other countries soon. Unfortunately, we do not have a comprehensive list. So if you see it available in your country, please add us on Twitter and we'll boost the signal. We have a couple of new patrons this week as well. We want to thank Neil Halstrom, Jared Rasher, Sassam, and Aaron Wortman. Thank you so much for your support of the show. Remember, even a dollar a month can help us collectively do a lot more with the show. Uh, there's also a couple of reviews I wanted to mention this week. The first one is from that guy 21 21 21 X. I think I got the number of 21s right. Uh, it's called Brian Beyond. It says, I have to say that if you love Young Justice, this is the definitive YJ podcast. I started listening after their appearance on DC Daily, and I had to check it out. One of the best podcasts that I'm currently subscribed to. Give it a listen for sure. I also wanted to mention uh, another five-star review from Kaleet28. It says, love, exclamation point. I've been binging ever since I saw you guys on DC Daily, and I'm so glad to find fellow fans of the show and the comics. Thanks so much. If you haven't had a chance to see us on DC Daily, uh, we're collectively on six or seven episodes. We'll get some links together on those and, and get those exact dates and times to you. Uh, So you can check them out, but also stay tuned next month when Hector Navarro joins us for a discussion session about rolling timelines in comics and his own secret origin. This month also, you can hear Emily and Neil guesting on The Math of You. Emily is available now and blew my mind about her meta narrative theory on the film The Greatest Showman. You should really check that out. And you'll be able to hear producer Neil guesting on the show later this month on the 28th. One of our listeners also pointed out that in my intro for Chris Newton's reprint episodes, I forgot to mention that you can hear he and I doing a deep dive on gaming and Young Justice on the Gameable Saturday Morning Podcast. We'll have links for all of those in the show notes. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. All right, guys, welcome to the Canary Debrief. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process uh, from the episodes that we review. So let's talk a little bit about character agency. I had mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about this before. So we've talked a lot about making sure that your protagonists have agency in their own story, meaning that they need to take actions and have consequences of their actions fall on them, whether they're positive or negative. So not having Superman show up to save Superboy, not having Batman 
tell Robin who he's going to be when he grows up, putting them in positions for them to be able to make those decisions for themselves so that they can have be fully realized people in the story. But something in this episode caught me off guard in such a good way, which was Crown Prince Gregor, a supporting cast character, fairly minor, important to Brion, having agency in this scene. It was so obvious to us that Baron Bedlam was far more trained in the use of his powers than Brion. But more importantly is the line that Gregor says, I know you, uncle. <laughs> it cannot be the first time in their lives that Brion and Gregor have suspected their uncle was a self-serving egomaniac. <laughs> there is, I mean, that is not, unless he is like a real highly skilled sociopath, those two twins have got to be talking about their uncle their whole life. And he knows Brion. He knows Brion didn't have powers before. He knows all the little personality traits of Brion to know that he can't hide that kind of a thing. Like, we, it's clearly in this. And if he had done anything else than what he did, I would have been bothered. Like, really? You're going to yeah. just listen to your uncle and throw this, throw your brother out? Like, none of that makes sense from a sibling. They seem to have a bond right? Like at least a sibling respect for one another. You know, they, they seem to care about each other. I don't know if they've got like a really tight best friend bond, but they at least care about each other, right? So even though Gregor is motivated by political machinations that were kind of tweaked up by uh, Zviad Bazovi, the decision that he made makes sense, right? For the time that he needs to do it for the country that he's in, he's not going to like arrest his brother, but he is going to say, you got to go. Until we can figure this out, you've got to go. And it makes perfect sense to me. So in addition to your protagonists having agency in your story, it's so critically important for your world to have agency. Your characters don't exist in a vacuum with other characters around them only reacting to your protagonist. Your protagonists, like skills and abilities, whatever they happen to be that help them get through the, the story that you're trying to tell them will seem even more impressive when your supporting cast and background characters are also working at full capacity. Absolutely agree. Can you think of stuff from the stuff that you've read too, where you've seen this happen before, either positive or negative, Emily? Like, it's a thin line sometimes between a character who has agency in a story, whether or not they're a supporting cast character or they kind of cross that weird line of almost being another protagonist. Like, particularly, you, for some reason, the thing I'm thinking of are the, are the Aragon books, right? <laughs> what? Just always, just always point Emily to her favorite YA series. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed it as well. I mean, I enjoyed it for what it was, particularly, I mean, Christopher Pellini was like, what, 17 or 16 when he, when he wrote he that? Was, he was 16 when he started that first book. <laughs> And then wrote them all over the course of like a decade. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. The whole thing. I, I Somebody bring me on a podcast to talk about Aragon. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's the, the characters, there's a, there's a, you have to, you're going to know this better than I do. So there's. Yes. There's a lot of characters. There is. But uh, there's, there's the, the elf, right? The wo the woman that he. Yes. Aria. It, Aria my girl. My who, girl, Aria. Who's supposed to. You're looking at this and you're reading the story and you're like, okay, they're clearly going to get in a relationship at some point. But then as the book moves on, you realize that, I mean, spoilers for Aragon, I guess, that that doesn't happen. Yes. To to be vague and to not spoil everything explicitly, there is, and Christopher Paolini has talked about this, about how when he first sat down and kind of outlined the series, he intended for them to get together. And then as he wrote it, he realized that did not make sense for Arya as a character. The yes. character that he writ that he wrote, and as she evolved in her own terms, he eventually got to a point in the series where he had originally intended for her to be like, and I am also in love with you. And he was like, but she's not. That's not who she is. And had to go through and be like, no, this character has agency in this decision, yes. and she can't do that. She can't be the character someone else wants her to be. She is who she is and she is having agency here and telling him no we i'm not gonna date you in this fantasy world but she also throughout the series despite being technically a minor character she is a major minor character but she is not like one of the pov characters for the series has a lot of agency despite the fact that her first introduction into the series is as an unconscious body to the point that a lot of people are like oh this is just going to be the pretty damsel in distress girl but the second 
she is rescued as an unconscious body when someone tries to telepathically communicate with her, she immediately attacks them with her mind because she's like, no, everything is a threat to me right now because I'm in a coma. <laughs> right. <laughs> and from that point on, right. she the once she like calms down and realizes it's an ally, she's like, okay, yes. I'm going to tell you the information I know because I can't stand right now, yeah. but I'm going to make sure that you can do what I need you to do so that all of us can live. The, there's a phrase that you used earlier that I think nails it, which yes. is she cannot be the character someone else needs her to be. Yes. And that's, I think that's the, that's the thought process to put in your head when you're creating a character like that or like Gregor in this scene. When you're, when you're writing a character and you're looking at it and saying, well, Baron Bedlam needs Gregor to be this and I need the plot to be this and I need Brian to be this. So Gregor has to do X. That means Gregor is only living in reaction to the things that are happening around him instead of having him have some, be a, be an active, important puzzle piece in what's going on around him makes it much more interesting. Even though the end result is the same where Brian gets banished from his home country, just like in the comics. How it happens makes a lot of sense and can really set you up for good relationship, like a good dynamic later on. If Brian and Gregor, you know, end up talking or, or getting back together, you know that that Gregor is, is still on Brian's side somehow at some level, even if he yeah. can't support him in the same way, which makes for a much, much more rich and um, uh, have, a, have a lot of energy, like potential energy sitting there waiting to be used by the story. And I think it's incredibly important. I agree. All right, let's move on to some fan service. Uh, Emily's got fan service again. <laughs> I'm on it. top of the fan service this season. Yeah. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. Uh, this week, we have another Tumblr artist who goes by Preshfin on Tumblr, and we'll have a link down to that in the show notes. And they just have some adorable fan art for YJ featuring different characters and different ships. And it's all just in a really super cute art style that people should check out. I really like them. We really enjoyed it. There's a great, and one of the ones that, the, the first one that I saw was Tim and Wonder Girl. And uh, that was really cute. But then I scrolled down and there's one of Impulse and, and Blue Beetle, like at a I don't know, like a soda fountain or something <laughs> like that together, which was just super cute together, too. They're real cute. It's a real cute style. Everything looks adorable. I love it. I love it, Definitely too. go check out their art. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some crashing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Uh, our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three, so up to episode three. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculation about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy and tin hatness. Uh, <laughs> these spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen uh, up to this point. If you're spoiler wary, of course, this is your warning. Yeah, let's dive into this one. So, if you didn't hear, if you didn't hear our crashing the mode from the first episode, you should go listen to that before this. Go listen to crashing the mode before this. Go listen to that one. Then once you come back, I'll tell you how. Uh, this time through, uh, watching this episode, I realized that uh, at the very end of the episode, that Doctor Doctor Helga Jace has green eyes, like like Otto from episode one of this season and I will shake my fist at the sky screaming Morgan's name into infinity because she's right. I think Morgan's right. She's real right. Yeah, I think so too. Um, the other thing that you noticed, I went back and rewatched and it is so subtle. And it's real subtle, but like it's the fact that you're 100% right. So the other thing I noticed on this watch through because I was paying Real close attention to to Doctor Helga Jace this time through because now I'm <laughs> just on level ten alert and nothing can be trusted. <laughs> on the beach, Jace notices and reacts to the fact that Halo's there, and I don't know what it means, but I saw it. And the fact that they include uh, Jace having a reaction and then us cutting to her eye line and her eye line is on Halo because that's what editing tells us. Yes. Uh, that's a that's that means something. And of course, when Vertigo first shows up in that scene, they show us Jace immediately goes to stand 
by Halo when Vertigo shows up. And like, I don't know what they're setting up, but I I don't know am either. Worried. Yeah. And like if she's been working with them, they're depending on what they did with Halo when they captured her, when they captured Gabriel, she does Jace know her? Did Jace put her in a pod and do that? Is that what happened? Mm-hmm. That's I absolutely think that's what happened. And and here's the thing. They they fold it in so ridiculous because it's 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 Jeff and Dick talking about like Dick's like, well, we didn't get what we wanted done, but we got some stuff done. And Jeff getting livid, right? Yes. Like, we lost all these kids. What the hell are you talking about? He's like, look, it was not the victory we wanted, but we saved all these people. And they show the camera cuts to Brion and Dr. Jace, right? And yeah. then it cuts to Halo. But the thing is, it's just like what you're talking about. The The shot of of Jace and Brion is straight ahead, right at their faces, like directly on them. So you're thinking, oh, they're just panning through all the people they saved, right? But the, But you watch Jace's face. Then it cuts to Halo and it's a side shot. So it's somebody looking at, looking at, looking at, at yes, it's somebody looking at Halo that is not getting eye contact with Halo. I've taken a film class. I know that that's how editing works. Yes. And then you cut back. I know it's beautiful, right? And then they cut back to Jace (laughs) and her eyes get subtly wider. Like she's just realizing who this person is. Because she hasn't like really seen Halo yet. She was interacting with Nightwing. Halo was helping out Artemis. They're in two separate areas of that facility she probably she probably didn't i mean they probably kidnapped this girl and then she didn't have her they didn't leave her hijab on while they did the tar procedure to her so they must have taken it off did no they did because she was she was wearing it when she was being buried she has it for the whole episode until she gets burned no no i i get that what i'm saying is that in the they may have put it back on her like after the procedure but i can't imagine i mean if you look at brian i don't know if you look at Brianna and you look at, at Superboy, right? Yeah. I'm just what I'm what I'm saying is there could be there could be reasons why she didn't recognize her at first, right? So then realizing who she was, you just watch her face because you and they distract you because they're like, oh, I know what you're doing. You're panning to people that we saved today, so we can remind. Oh, that's nice, but you're not watching we'll just the background. Pay attention to the dialogue. God, you're killing me with that observation. That's brutal. So I just don't know. And we know that later on, something weird, ha- there's a weird interaction hair with brush. that. There's a thing about a hairbrush. Uh, if you're listening now and haven't seen all 13 episodes, there's a hairbrush scene where we're both really <laughs> kind of off put by, I don't know, episodes. I'm just saying. There's a hairbrush scene that's that's weirdly unnerving to both of us. So yeah. <laughs> we just don't trust anything. We don't, not anymore. Never. <laughs> But I think that's all of our crashing the mode this week. I think it's all I can handle this week. Yeah. What do we do now? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Artemis. Ugh. All right. So in with that painful realization, uh, I think we can say to out of the watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us at Twitter at the YJ Files on Facebook at Crashing the Mode on Tumblr at the YJ Files dot Tumblr dot com on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email email us. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. So make it easy on us, please. (laughs) Please. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone.